So after a week long pilgrimage walking with Jesus through the final moments of his life and his death, we finally arrive at the empty tomb of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Resurrection Sunday, as we call it. There are explosive truths that we are celebrating. And if we allow the sentimentality that surrounds it to dissipate, you know, the bunnies, eggs, chocolate and flowers, those can sometimes co-op Easter, turning into another consumer driven holiday. But we got to listen beyond those truths to some explosive truths that Jesus rose from the dead to never die again. That Jesus was victorious against his enemies in a way that no one saw coming. Speaking of his enemies this morning, I want to spend some time hearing from a man who was an enemy of Christ. That man being the Apostle Paul. If you could turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If this is your first time using a Bible, there should be a table of contents in the front of your Bible. You will find 1 Corinthians right after the book of Romans. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The writer of this book, Paul, was an enemy of Jesus. He didn't just hate Jesus. He hated anybody that rode with Jesus. He had followers of Jesus killed. He, he tried to do away with Christianity like many have tried after him. But on one glorious day, Jesus appeared to Paul. This messed Paul up, right? Because Jesus was supposed to be dead. This means the rumors were true. Jesus really did rise from the grave. Needless to say, Paul became a Christian. And the resurrection, if you read the, Old, if you read the New Testament, if you read his epistles, the resurrection always held a, a dear place in the heart of Paul. So let's start by reading 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, and then we're going to skip all the way down to verse 22. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8. For I delivered to you as of first importance, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And if you can go down to verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. When I became a Christian, I remember the first Resurrection Sunday with my new church family in Framingham, thinking to myself, really, we are celebrating the greatest injustice of all time. Did you hear what I said? We are, we're celebrating the greatest injustice of all time. Now, you may be saying, what? Christians don't celebrate injustice, right? Well, you're absolutely right. We don't. We serve a just God. But the message of Easter Sunday is that an innocent man died for the crimes of others, our crimes. And by his punishment, we have been forgiven. The guilty caught in 4K HD, right? No doubt that we are guilty. No doubt that we are the guilty party. And no doubt who is the innocent party. And yet the innocent Jesus is found guilty and the guilty are forgiven. I don't know how y'all doing in New England. I'm from Louisiana, not the smartest man by far. But that sounds like injustice, doesn't it? The resurrection and the idea of injustice between Jesus and mankind was important to Paul. And not just to Paul, another apostle named Peter as well. Peter rode with Jesus, um, kind of flaky at times. You got people in your life like that? You don't know if they're really for you or not? Well, Peter was like that sometimes when Jesus was arrested by the Romans, Peter was asked, do you know Jesus? And Peter responded, Jesus, who? Yet verse seven of our text, 
says that Peter saw Jesus again. And Peter wasn't flaky anymore. He was on fire for Christ. And he wrote some books about Jesus. And he says this in 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins. And then get this. He says this. The righteous for the unrighteous. See, Peter had injustice on his mind as well. But going back, back to our brother Paul, we get three quick points from what we see in this text that I hope will encourage some of us to greater devotion to Jesus because of the great love that he has given us. And I hope it encourages some of you to get to know him if you do not know him. These three points are this. We lost it all. He did it all. And we get it all. Can y'all can y'all say that with me? Number one, we lost it all. He did it all. We get it up. OK, see, that's what I'm talking about. Y'all making a southern boy feel at home. OK, they said, don't go to the north. It's the frozen chosen up there, but not in here. Right. No, y'all are alive and well. Amen. All right. This is going to be this is going to be fun. Then let's go. Point one. We lost it all. Verse three. For I delivered to you of as of first importance, which I also received that Christ died for our sins. That was the goal for humanity was that we would glorify God and that we would find joy in him. That was it. That was the goal God had for humanity. Joy forever. We would glorify God by filling the earth with other humans, cultivating the earth and having a personal relationship with the creator. That was the goal. The first humans, Adam and Eve, they experienced what perfection was like. No pain, no suffering, no letdowns, just abundant life. Then Satan, the serpent, came along. He convinced them that God was holding out on them and that they didn't need God and that they themselves could be gods. And Adam and Eve, our first parents, decided to go their own way by disobeying God, their creator. And through their disobedience, sin came into the word. Now, sin is an interesting word. For many of us, it means bad things that we do that are against God's commands. And amen, that's, that is a definition of sin as well. But sin is more than that. Sin is in our nature. Our nature is to turn from God, his word, and to do our own thing. I'll give you a couple examples. God, through the divine son, Jesus Christ says, love your enemies. But we say, nah, we're going to hate our enemies and we're going to seek revenge when we feel someone has done something to us. Jesus says, I'm the living water, satisfaction for your soul. We say, nah, we know what we need. We're going to find joy through sex, money, drugs and other things. And what we do is we try to seek joy and satisfaction from created things and it never works. Never works. And you may not be a Christian and you may not be a religious person, but if you're honest with yourself, if you're honest in your heart, you know there is nothing in this world that you can receive that will completely satisfy you. You've heard it from other people that have more than you, how they've reached all their goals and yet they feel empty and lost. Well, this is because we were created to be satisfied by God. It's in our nature to turn from God. And we have all sinned. When Adam and, in, Adam and Eve sinned against God, well, they broke fellowship with God. They now have sinned against the holy God. There was a division now. They are guilty. They lost it all. We lost it all. We have sinned against God and we deserve his punishment, which the Bible tells us is death. Death entered the world through sin. It was never part of the plan, even though God saw it, that death would be a thing. Yet death entered the world through sin, not just physical death, but spiritual death, meaning that we will be separated from God in hell for eternity because we sin against an eternal God. God is the highest ex authority in existence. The penalty is life. The stakes are higher. We lost it all. But thanks be to God. He did it all. Amen. He did it all. Look at verse uh, verse three and verse four. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he that he was buried, 
that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. You see, the scriptures show us that God had a plan all along. God's plans cannot be stopped. He's not like us. We, we hope our plans come true. God says, my will will be done. Some say, well, God created man and they sinned, so he had to come up with a plan to save them. No, God is not like us. God did not find himself in some holy predicament. No, God had already decided our rescue plan. This is why Paul keeps saying in the text, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, God knew we would mess up. God promised Adam and Eve that Eve would have a son and that son would crush the head of the serpent, who was Satan. But that the son, which is Jesus, would also be bit on his heel, meaning Jesus would die. And the prophets continued to prophesy about this future son that was going to come to fix all of our wrongs. One prophet, Isaiah, says this. Isaiah, he says in his book, uh, Isaiah 53, verses 9 through 11, he says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Did you catch what I just read? You see, the whole Old Testament is waiting for that son to come. Eve thought it was her son Cain. Uh, some thought it was David, but it was neither one of them. But Jesus steps on the scene. Jesus is God in the flesh, the, the son of God. Jesus is the word. The word became flesh and it dwelt among us. The incarnation. Jesus comes to earth. See, God loved us so much. He sent himself in the presence of Jesus, in the person of Jesus. He stood in our place. He was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. Jesus was crucified for our sins. During our evening service this past Friday, we went into detail about the crucifixion. I'll just give you two points right here. Jewish historian Josephus, he called death by crucifixion the most pitiful of deaths. The Roman writer Cicero, he said, Roman citizens, citizens should remove even the thought of prisoners uh, being crucified from their eyes and ears because it's such a hideous death. Jesus was mocked. Jesus was tortured for our iniquities. He lived the life we couldn't. Perfect obedience to God, living to do the will of the father with boldness. He spoke truth and yet he was murdered for our sins. What this tells us is that the life that we know isn't at all life, but death. The enemy Satan has blinded us to the glorious truth that God loves us and that God has provided a way for us to be right with him. Right with him, meaning because God isn't a God of injustice, he is a just God. And it would be just if he would have just destroyed us all. It would be just if God would give us what we deserved. It would be just. But yet instead, God shows his love for us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And this is why, get this, this is why Paul says that Jesus rising from the grave is of first importance. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the most important event in history. You must wrestle. I'll give you with three truths that you must wrestle with if you're wondering about Jesus and the faith. The first one is this. There is the fact that Jesus's tomb was empty. Indeed, if it wasn't for the empty tomb, Christianity as a movement could never have gotten off the ground. If his body was found, then there was no resurrection. Doug, can you put that slide up? So first, there is the fact that Jesus's tomb was empty. Second, 
we have the testimony of and about the eyewitnesses. As you see in your text in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, Paul records that Jesus appeared to Peter, the 12, 500 brothers and sisters at once, then to James, then to all the apostles, and finally to Paul himself. Paul is saying, if you don't believe me, go ask the others who saw him. Also, we know from the gospel accounts that the first eyewitnesses were women. In the ancient world, women did not have a high social status. And so this would have been an embarrassment to the disciples. They would have never used these women as witnesses. And yet they do because it is true. They saw the risen savior. And then third, we see the impact of Jesus's resurrection, what it had on his earliest followers. The earliest followers of Jesus did not stand to gain riches or fame from preaching the gospel. Quite the contrary. Many preached the gospel at the cost of their own lives. They did not invent this story and then die for this invented story. Something motivated them to be willing to spread the message, even in the face of suffering and death, because Jesus rose from the grave. Your biggest decision in your life is not what college you're going to go to, not what career field you're going to go into, not who you're going to marry, not your political side. You have to make a decision. Do I believe that Jesus rose from the grave? Because if he didn't, then who cares what he says? Continue to do what you do. Live your life. But if he did, then everything else he said matters. We lost it all. He did it all. And last, though it makes no sense and it's, and it's injustice, we get it all. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. We get it all. It's injustice like you've never seen before. We are forgiven because another stands in our place. Mankind can now have peace with God again. Mankind can now have a personal relationship with the creator because we can become children of God. Yes. You see, we are, we are not all children of God. Adam, who was our earthly representation, see, he sinned against God and he brought sin and death in the world. But Jesus, the divine son of God, he became man so he could represent us and save us and take our punishment. Jesus lived the obedient life that we could have never lived with loving God with all of his heart and with all of his mind, living to do the will of the father. Jesus died and God the father raised him from the dead to show that the debt for sin had been paid. So to be right with God, God is looking for Jesus in your life. He's not looking for your good works. Don't let this be another year of dressing up and going to church thinking that when you die, you will be able to stand before God and not receive the penalty of an entire life of sin, which you deserve. He isn't after your good works. See, Christians, we do good works in response to the love that Christ showed us. We don't do good works to receive God's love so that he will love us. No, he already loves us and he showed it by sending his only son to die for us. We do good works in response to that. He's already given us everything. God is looking to see if you know his son. God is looking to see if you have repented of your sins. And what that means is you confess that you are a sinner and you ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you and to come into your life and be your savior. Believing in the resurrection of Jesus, because the word says in Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the only way to be right with God. Jesus is a living hope, not just for our salvation either, but for the world we live in today, the day to day. Everything that's wrong with the world, all of the confusion, all of the division. It streams from a world that has turned its back on God and doing things our own way. And that's even in our personal life. 
But when you bring Jesus into darkness, you get light. When you bring Jesus into chaos, you receive peace. When you bring Jesus into death, you get life. So I'm going to leave us with this. If you're a Christian, the resurrection is not a happy ending to the death of Jesus. It's the beginning of God's new creation. God is calling you to expand his kingdom. He didn't save you so you could live in bondage to sin. He freed you from that. He didn't save you so you could live like the rest of the world, wasting your life on material items that you can't even take with you. He is calling you into his work of grace. Because of the resurrection, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he returns. We don't live in fear. We see what's going on in the world. No matter what we hear on TV or the radio, we don't we don't we don't live in fear, but we let the peace of Christ reign in our hearts and mind because we know how the story ends, don't we? We know that he is returning and one day there'll be no more sin, no more death, no more tears, no more pain. But until then, we proclaim his, his, his truth to those who need it, letting them know that they can be freed from addiction. Letting them know that they may not have a father or a mother who loves them, but there is a father who loves them more than they could ever know. There's a family, a church family, real life that they can touch and be around in this community, that they could come to this church and be loved as they learn and grow to know Jesus Christ. That is what we should do. That's what the resurrection means for the Christians, for those of us who know him. But if you haven't believed in Jesus, the resurrection, resurrection message is this. Jesus is the right choice. Jesus can be trusted. There's a lot of phony stuff out there and a lot of people out there claiming that they can bring you satisfaction. They know uh, how to get you to where you need to go so you can be happy. It's not real. It's fake. And what you find is you give everything to those people. You give everything to this world and you get nothing in return. Maybe some moments of enjoyment, but nothing satisfies. Because you were created for Jesus. You were created for more. Stop selling yourself short and turn to your creator for real life. And he can be trusted. And since he can be trusted, you can trust his word. And his word says that he will return. He came the first time on a donkey riding into Jerusalem. It was a sign of peace that man could have peace with God. But we know from scriptures when he returns, he will not be on a donkey. He will be on a horse. And that means he will return for war. To raise war against those who chose Satan's kingdom instead of entering into God's kingdom. There's hope that you can step in today. You can be freed from sin. Jesus wants that for your life and he will come and fill you up with his spirit and he'll start that new creation in you. He promises to never leave you or forsake you. He doesn't lie to you like the commercials do and tell you everything's going to be great. He tells you there will be persecution. You live in a fallen world, but he will be with us through it all until he returns. He is a good savior. He is a gentle and kind, a strong and kind savior. We know our worth because the divine son of God died for us and we know he lives. So I pray that if you're a Christian here, you, that you would give your life to Jesus, rededicate your life to Jesus, that you would leave here encouraged that this, that this would this fire, this zeal for the Lord would go into the rest of this year, that you would speak truth to those who a world that needs it. Right. A dying world that needs it. Please bow your heads with me. I'm going to pray for us as we uh, close up. Father, thank you for your unwavering faithfulness. Um, um, you are a firm foundation that when the storm comes, we can stand on you. Any trial or tribulation that comes our way, we know that we can cling to you. But not only in this world but also in the next, that we know that when we stand before God, that we can say, look, we know our good works will not save us, but we believe in the son, Jesus Christ, and his good work that he did on the cross and that he died for our sins. And God, you accepted that because Jesus rose from the grave three days later. 
We place our faith in that. We confess that we are sinners and we ask for Jesus Christ to come into our lives and be our savior. Um, that is the gospel. That is the good news of humanity. That the whole world was on the way to experience the wrath of God and God himself pardoned our sins by sending his son, Jesus Christ, and died in our place. Father, thank you for that, that gospel message. May we, may those of us here who know you, may we speak that truth to ourselves and may we speak that truth to others to let them know that the door is open, that they can enter it, but they have to enter it on their own. Father, for those here who do not know you, I pray that they would, before they leave this morning, Father, that you would touch their hearts, give them boldness, that they could ask more questions that they may be having. But Lord, I pray that you would, you would give them even more boldness, that they would drop their pride, and they would trust in your son, Jesus Christ, who has solved the greatest problem in the human world, is what are we going to do with sin? Because we've all sinned. And the answer is Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray for those here who um, are wrestling with that, Lord, that your spirit would convict them, that they would receive you as Savior right there in their seats. Lord, I pray for this church. Lord, I thank you. As me and the men this morning were praying, thank you that for many years this church has been preaching the resurrect resurrection message every Sunday. And we would continue to do that every Sunday because it is the hope. It is our only hope. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.